Well, good morning, beloved. We're going to pick back up in the book of Joshua this morning in chapter 12. And we're going to begin with chapter 12 and we'll get into the first verse six, first six verses of chapter 13 uh, when we close. But chapter 12 gives us a summary of the victories on the east and the west side of Jordan by Moses and Joshua. So let's read the first six verses of Joshua chapter 12 to begin with. Now these are the kings of the land which the children of Israel smote and possessed their land on the other side Jordan towards the rising of the sun. From the river Arnon unto Mount Hermon and all the plain of the east, Sihon, king of the Amorites who dwelt in Heshbon and ruled from Aurora, which is upon the bank of the river Arnon and from the middle of the river and from half Gilead even unto the river Jabbok, which is the border of the children of Ammon, and from the plain to the Sea of Chinneroth, which is the Sea of Galilee, on the east, and unto the Sea of the Plain, even the Salt Sea on the east, the way to Beth Jeshemoth, and from the south under Ashdoth Pisgah, and the coast of Og, king of Bashan, which was of the remnant of the giants that dwelt at Ashtaroth and at Edri, and reigned in Mount Hermon and in Salca, and in all Bashan, unto the border of the Geshurites, and the Machathites, and the half Gilead, the brother of Sihon, king of Heshbon, them did Moses the servant of the Lord and the children of Israel smite. And Moses the servant of the Lord gave it for a possession unto the Reubenites, and the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh. Now, again, verses 1 through 6 that we just read gives us the account of the victories under Moses on the east side of Jordan before they crossed over Jordan. The two kings listed are King Sihon of the Amorites who dwelt in Heshbon and, the, and Og the king of Bashan which was of the remnant of the giants. The tribe of Reuben, Gad, and half-tribe of Manasseh inherited these lands. And now from verses 7 to 24, we're going to read about a summary of the conquest of those on the other side of Jordan that was conquered, uh, which would have been on the west side of the Jordan, <clears throat> towards the Mediterranean. And we begin reading, And these are the kings of the country which Joshua and the children of Israel smote on this side Jordan on the west, from Balgad in the valley of Lebanon, that's way up north, even into Mount Halak, that goes up to Seir, that's up north, which Joshua gave unto the tribes of Israel for a possession according to their divisions, in the mountains and in the valleys and in the plains and the springs and in the wilderness and in the south country, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And then it starts listing now, verse 9, 31 kings. And we'll, we'll read it, but that's how many there is. There's the king of Jericho, the king of Ai, okay, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Heshbon, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, the king of Gezer, the king of Deber, the king of Geder, the king of Horma, the king of Arad, the king of Libna, the king of Adullam, the king of Makeda, the king of Bethel, the king of Tapua, the king of Hefer, the king of Aphek, the king of Lasharon, the king of Madon, the king of Hazor, the king of Shimron, Meron, the king of Akshaf, the king of Tanakh, the king of Megiddo, the king of Kedesh, the king of Jokneam of Carmel, the king of Dor, the king of the nations of Gilgal, the king of Terza. All the kings, 30 and 1, or 31 kings, were defeated on the west side of Jordan. Two kings and their armies on the east side of Jordan, and 31 kings on the west side of Jordan. Now, what we just read, of course, I said, gives us an account of those victories on the west side of Jordan by Joshua. Remember, Moses was not allowed to enter into the promised land because of his disobedience in striking the rock rather than speaking to the rock. He was allowed to see it, however, from Mount Pisgah. Let me read for you Deuteronomy 32, verses 48 through 52. And the Lord spoke to Moses the selfsame day, saying, Get thee up 
to this mountain Abiram unto Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho, and behold the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession. And die in the mount where you go up, and be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother died in Mount Hor, and was gathered to his people. Because you trans you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the water of Meribah, Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin, because you sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel. Yet thou shalt see the land before thee, but thou shalt not go therein unto the land which I give to the children of Israel. Now, <clears throat> what had happened was this, beloved. The first time the children of Israel started grumbling and murmuring about not having water, God instructed him to strike a rock. And out of that rock came water. And so Moses did, and he did that, and it was enough water for all the children of Israel to, have, to get uh, water for themselves, water for their animals. It was an amazing miracle. And the second time that they started complaining in their journeys about it, they was running out of water again, he told Moses to speak to the rock. And, in, and Moses was angry at the children of Israel because of their murmuring, complaining, and, and he struck the rock again. Now, God graciously allowed water to come out of the rock when he struck it, but he disobeyed God. And, and the reason God kept him from going in and the punishment seemed so severe to, the, to Moses who had led the children so often is because God, through these two examples at the rocks, were try, was trying to teach and to give us a picture of Christ and what he would do and what he would accomplish at the cross. You say, well, what do you mean? How does two rock? Well, the New Testament tells us that the rock that followed them was Christ. And when, when Moses first struck the rock and the water came out, Jesus is the water of life. He gives life. But when he was struck down at the cross, his sacrifice according to Hebrews, was a one-for-all-time sacrifice, never needing to be sacrificed again. That's why what the Roman Catholics do in their masses is, is a blasphemy by saying that the blood, the, the, the wine and the, and the bread becomes the flesh and the blood of Jesus actually being sacrificed again. That is, that's, a, that's a heresy. It's a blasphemy. It's not true. Because Christ was offered once for all time for all the sins of his people, past, present, and future. And you can see that plainly over in Hebrews around chapter 10, 11, 12, if you go over there and read. And so when he struck the rock the first time, it represented Christ being struck at the cross, given his life, sacrificing himself. But when God said the next time you can speak to the rock, not hit the rock, the reason for that is, is because now Christ does not have to be sacrificed again. We, he opened up the door into the very presence of God behind the veil to where we could come in now boldly and ask for grace and mercy to help in time of need. We now can come straight into the throne room of God and talk to God, not through a priest, because we're all priests who, who have come to know Christ. We're all a part of the priesthood. We all have been given the privilege of talking and coming into the presence of God Almighty through the blood of Jesus Christ. So you see, he was to speak to the rock, not strike the rock again. And Christ will never be sacrificed again because his sacrifice was a one-time-for-all-time sacrifice. So that's that was why... God didn't allow Moses to go into the promised land because he misrepresented Christ to the people, to the picture of what God was trying to show them in speaking to the rock. I hope you see that, beloved. But now let's look at Deuteronomy 34, 1 through 8, and it gives us a little bit more information about this. It says, Moses went up from the plains of Moab and to the mountain of Nebo, to the, mount, to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead and Dan, and all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah unto the utmost sea, and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zoar, 
And the Lord said to him, This is the land which I swore unto Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over there. So Moses the servant of the Lord died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor. But no man knows his, of his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. So you see, Moses was not allowed to enter into the promised land because of his disobedience in striking the rock instead of speaking to the rock. Now, the land inherited on the east side of Jordan was much less than the land inherited on the west side of Jordan. On the east side of Jordan, two kings were defeated, and their land were taken. On the west side of Jordan, 31 kings were defeated, and their lands taken. Now, A.W. Pink looks at this typically. First, he looks at it redemptively, and secondly, he looks at it spiritually. A uh, quote from A.W. Pink, he looks at it redemptively for the fruits of Christ's mediatorial work. Far more of his saints have benefited therefrom since his death. And you see, here's a, here's a thing. The Jordan represents death. It represents us a picture of us crossing over into our promised land. You see, because God has promised us an inheritance in heaven, a place reserved for us. And uh, and so the death is kind of is there's actually used to be an old song. You won't have to cross Jordan alone, meaning that you won't have to die alone. God will be there with you. Uh, the scripture says precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And if you remember in in uh, Luke chapter 16, where when Lazarus died, it says the angels took him and carried him into the bosom of Abraham. So so it says uh A.W. Pink says, The saints have far more benefited since the death of Christ than those who were saved by him during the days of his public ministry. Spiritually, in connection with the believer's salvation, a portion of his inheritance is entered into and enjoyed by him before the Jordan is crossed, meaning before you die. But the principal part of it lies on the farther side of Jordan or of death. So he sees this as a picture of, Yes, we have some inheritance on this side of Jordan, but the majority, the, the bulk of our inheritance is on the other side of Jordan. And just as there's a two-part nature of the physical inheritance of the land, even so there is a two-part nature of our spiritual inheritance. Now here's some scriptures that give evidence to that. John fourteen twelve, Verily, verily, I say to thee, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And that means after he crosses over Jordan. And when he says greater works, he's not talking about more miraculous works. He's talking about greater in scope. Okay, And, and if you think about it, in Jesus' short three years that he was here on the earth, there was, there was many that came to him. But after he left and sent the Holy Spirit back, Christianity exploded and it spread throughout the whole world. And so, in essence, those who received the Holy Spirit were able to do more because not, not more miraculous, but more in the scope of the reaching people for Christ. So, why were they able to do that? Because the Holy Spirit was sent to indwell us at Pentecost. Now, 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. Now, he which establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has also sealed us. Now, that word seal means to stamp with a signet or a private mark for security and preservation. And so, it's he sealed us, okay, and given the earnest, and that earnest means a pledge or or part of the purchase money or property given in advance of the security. Sort of, it's a deposit. He's given us an earnest or a deposit of the Spirit in our hearts. In other words, here's a down payment of what's to come. That's the Spirit of God given to us. But, beloved, there's a lot more to come when we cross Jordan. 
So, and let me read that for you in the easy read version. That Second Corinthians one twenty one and twenty two. It makes it a little easier to understand. And God is the one who makes you and us strong in Christ. God is also the one who chose us for His work. He put His mark on us to show that we are His. Yes, He put His Spirit in our hearts as the first payment that guarantees all that He will give us. Now that that sounds a lot easier to understand than the old King James English. John 14, 2 and 3. Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. See, beloved, we're still on this side of Jordan. And and we haven't crossed over Jordan to the place that's prepared for us yet. And that's the picture that we you need to see when we're reading through Joshua. Because it is. It's a picture of what Christ has done. Psalm 31, 19. Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up. And that word laid up, that phrase laid up, means reserved for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of man. So you see, we have... A lot of good things laid up for us because we've come to fear the Lord and give our life to Him. Isaiah 64, 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither have they seen by the eye of God beside the uh, seen of, O oh God, beside thee, besides God, what He has prepared for Him that waits for Him. Beloved, <laughs> The other side of Jordan awaits us, and it's going to be beyond what we can imagine, beyond our wildest dreams. 2 Timothy 4.8, henceforth, or from here on out, Paul said, and this, Paul's, this is Paul uh, speaking after he's just said that uh, the time of my departure is at hand. He knew that he was getting ready to be beheaded by a Roman soldier. In writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, eight, he says, Henceforth, or hereafter, there is laid up, there it is again, the word reserved for me, a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Beloved, do you love his appearing? If you do, if you're looking forward to and longing for him to return, there's a crown of righteousness waiting on you. So as I hope we can clearly see from these few passages, and there, there's more, but these are just a few of them, there is much more to our inheritance waiting for us on the other side of Jordan. As we looked at some of these things last week in more detail, well, let's look at verse, I want you to pay attention to verse 7 and then verse 24. In verse 7 we read, And these are the kings of the country which Joshua and the children of Israel smote on this side Jordan on the west. And then he says, verse 24, All the kings, 30 and 1. Now, A.W. Pink brings out something interesting. He says, It may be thought strange that there should have been so many kings in such a small country. In reality, it supplies evidence of the accuracy and veracity of this historical record, for it is in perfect accord with the ancient practice followed in various countries, namely, that many of their principal cities had their own separate kings. Historians inform us that when Julius Caesar landed in Britain, he found four kings in a single county of Kent. Joshua's conquest of all those kings illustrate the truth that the more entirely our hearts are fixed upon the Lord our strength, the more certainly will our foes, however powerful or numerous, be subdued before us. And then Pink brings out one other thing that's kind of interesting, and you can take this or leave it, but he says, according to Gematria, and I had to look that up to see what it is. Gematria is the ancient practice of using letters instead of figures. For our modern numbers were unknown to the ancients. So they used the letters and assigned them numerical values. He says the use, uh, he says Gematria, in Gematria 31 equals EL. Or in other words, 
the the two letters e and l when the value of those values are added together it equals 31 okay and so l is the name of god and he just that's just kind of interesting and he closes his quote by if then he be for us who can be against us well that finishes chapter 12 and i hope you've seen some things in chapter 12 that gives you something to think about and maybe even to go back and look up and pray about. But now let's jump over into chapter 13. The first six verses of chapter 16, uh, If refer to your map to see some of the locations of the people that still needed to be driven out of the land. Uh, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. Now Joshua was, was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said to him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remains yet very much land to be possessed. This is the land that yet remains. All the borders of the Philistines. And you see on your map it says Philistia, that's the area. And all Geshuri from Sihor, which is before Egypt, even unto the borders of Ekron northward, which is counted to the Canaanite. Five lords of the Philistines, the Gazathites, the Ashtathites, the Escalonites, the Gittites, and the Ekronites, and the, also the Avites. Now, if you remember, if you, uh, just as a side note, that's the Philistines was the ones that uh, that uh, David went against and conquered, and then later on, when the ju- time of the judges, uh, when when they went away from following uh, God and God put them under bondage, then they cried out to God and Samson, the the judge, Samson was the one that went against the Philistines to deliver them from the Philistines. Okay, so they were always a thorn in the flesh, the Philistines. But he says, um, from the south all the land of the Canaanites and to Meriari, that is beside the Sidonians, which is way up in the north, and to Aphek, to the borders of the Amorites, and the land of the Giblites, and all Lebanon, that's way up in the north, towards the sun rising from Balgad under Mount Hermon, that's way up in the north, until the entering into Hamath, all the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon and to Mesrephoth Mame, and all the Sidonians, will I, them will I drive out from before the children of Israel. Only divide thou it by lot unto the children, unto the Israelites for an inheritance as I have commanded thee. Now, chapter 13 is a chapter that doesn't really lend itself to a lot of comments. It consists largely of uh, geographical details, of which I'm certain you probably have very little interest in. Uh, These six verses describe the people and lands that still need to be conquered and driven out. The next six verses, the Lord begins giving instructions for the dividing of the land to the different tribes. But before we look at the next six verses... I want you to take notice of two statements from the Lord to Joshua. First, there remains yet very much land to be possessed. And then, them will I drive out from before the children of Israel. Now the land of Canaan was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. It was a free grant from God. Yet, it had to be conquered by them. Don't miss this, beloved. This is an important truth we're going to be looking at. There are two great truths that at first glance seem to contradict each other. He tells them, there's very much land you still have to possess. But then he says, I'll drive them out before you. Israel, he says, you must possess the land. You must fight. You must battle in order to possess the land. And then God says, but I'll drive them out from before you. Now our salvation... And our inheritance were obtained by Christ Jesus our Lord. Yet it is not entered into by the heirs of promise without much effort on their part. 1 Corinthians 4 7. For who makes you to differ from another? And what hast thou that you did not receive? Now, if you did receive it, why do you glory as if you had not received it? You know, beloved, that goes right along with the truth that. Some people brag about their faith. Well, I believed in God. Well, you didn't believe in God until he granted you faith. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. And some people brag on their repentance. Oh, well, I turned away and I repented of all that. Well, you didn't repent 
until God granted you repentance. Because 2 Timothy 2, 24-26 says that if God peradventure will grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So you see, we received our salvation. It was a gift from God. Now, but this doesn't mean that the regenerated soul, the born-again person, is to remain a passive agent. For we read in Luke 13, 24, listen to it, strive to enter in at the straight gate. In Hebrews 4, 11, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Philippians 2.12 Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as you, as, always, as, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We see three words, strive, labor, work out. That doesn't sound passive, does it? It, it shows us that we're to be active in our Christian walk. And did Christ provide the salvation for us? You better believe it. But we don't let go and let God. There's a work. There's a battle. There's a daily fight and a striving and a laboring and a working out of our salvation that we have. We are saved. It is true that faith is a gracious gift of God, but that's just the starting point, the beginning of the journey, or should I say the beginning of the fight. 2 Peter 1, 5-11, he says, Give all diligence to add to your faith. And then he lists the things that were to add to our faith in that passage. He says, Add to it virtue, knowledge, temperance or self-control, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity or agape love. And then he goes on to say, Give diligence or work hard to make your calling and election Sure, for in this way, for so in this way, an entrance shall be ministered to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now that sounds like, wait a minute, Christ provided everything for me. Yes, he did. He provided your salvation. He did everything that needs to be done. You do not earn your salvation. You do not merit your salvation. That is a bought, purchased possession. But, Salvation is the starting point. It's like a race when the flag is dropped. That flag that is dropped is your salvation. Now the rest of it is you working out your salvation and you running the race that God has given you to run. Colossians 3.24 or 3.23 and 24, this is really interesting. It says, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward or the recompense or the payment of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Now, that word heartily, you know what it means when you look it up in the Greek dictionary? It speaks of till you're out of breath. Whatever you do, do it till you're out of breath to the Lord. In other words, <laughs> give all that you got in your service for the Lord. And you'll receive, you'll be rewarded with your inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. A.W. Pink said, again, the Christian is a moral agent and grace has been given him to improve, mean, to improve, okay? Means of grace have been provided and he is responsible, the Christian is responsible to employ the same, to employ those means of grace, that God has given us. He has a conflict to engage in, a race to run. There is a world for him to overcome, a devil to resist, a salvation to be worked out with fear and trembling. He must tread the narrow way. He must endure to the end. He must fight the good fight of faith if he is to enter into the eternal inheritance. Now, that kind of sounds like, well, that means, I, that kind of looks like, sounds like I'm working for my salvation. No, it does not. These are the evidences that will accompany all those who are truly saved. All those who are truly saved and been given the means of grace, they will fight. They will run. They will overcome. They will resist. They will tread the narrow way. They will endure until the end. They will fight the good fight of faith 
Why? Because Christ is in them, helping them to accomplishment, accomplish it. David said, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Psalm 119, 101. Paul said, every man that strives for the mastery is temperate or self-controlled in all things. They do. In other words, somebody is trying to win a race. They don't eat a bunch of ice cream and all kinds of fatty foods and just eat, eat, eat. No, they watch what they eat. They control their bodies. They exercise. They get themselves in shape. They strive for the mastery. And it's the same thing in the spiritual realm, beloved. And that's why they use these physical illustrations to show us about the spiritual realities. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown. They're talking about the natural man, the world. But we do it spiritually to obtain an incorruptible crown. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 1 Corinthians nine twenty-five through 27 so, even though David's sins were covered and his inheritance sure, he still, quote, refrained, refrained his feet from the evil way. Even though Paul's sins were covered and, it, and his inheritance sure, he still, quote, strove for the mastery. He ran certainly, he fought skillfully, and he kept under control his body. Yet, he did not do these things of his own self-sufficiency. No one can. He wrote in 2 Corinthians two fifteen and 16, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death to death, to the other the savor of life to life. Now listen, beloved, and who is sufficient for these things? That's a rhetorical question, beloved. None of us. None of us are sufficient for these things. His sufficiency was not found in himself, but in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Philippians 4.13 he wrote, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And in 1 Corinthians 3.9 he said, We are laborers together with God. So you see, beloved, it's not let go and let God. It's work hard, strive till you're out of breath to serve the Lord, and God will work with you. A.W. Pink again says, True indeed it was by divine grace that those men conducted themselves thus. Yet they were active moral agents therein, and not passive ciphers. Now when I read that word ciphers, I had to go look it up. I had no idea what it meant. And it means a person with no will of their own. Okay? Thus also was Canaan a divine gift unto Abraham and his descendants, but they had to fight, fight long and hard in order to enter into possession of that same property. True also that the Lord fought for them and that their victories must be ascribed to him who so signally showed himself strong in their behalf. Nevertheless, that altered not the fact that they fought and subdued their foes. Both the divine and the human sides are to be recognized and owned by us. In like manner, our salvation has the same two sides unto it. God is indeed both the Alpha and Omega thereof, yet he deals with us as rational creatures and enforces our responsibility in connection with the same. Believers are required to use the means of grace which God has appointed, and look to him to bless the, bless the same. You see, vegetables and trees are incapable of taking precautions against pests and tornadoes. But we are obliged to avoid evil, resist temptation, take shelter from the storm. Eternal life is a divine gift. Romans 6.23, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But we are to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. 1 Timothy 6.12 Our inheritance is a purchased 
possession, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest or down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. You see, our inheritance is a purchased possession, already bought and paid for by Christ. Yet, it is also a reward for service to the Lord. In Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, do it heartily until you're out of breath as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that the Lord of the Lord, you shall receive the reward and that of the inheritance. The reward being a recompense, a pay for services rendered. Grace is freely given, but we are to use it and must improve the same if we would receive more. Luke 8.18 8, Take heed therefore how you hear, for whoever has to him shall be given. Matthew 25.16 Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them another five talents. Now that's all the end of the quote by A.W. Pink, but beloved, I hope you saw some important truths there. There are some very important truths. I would like to add one more verse to Mr. Pink's commentary. John 1, 16. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. The ESV says grace upon grace. You see, salvation's the starting point, beloved. By his grace, you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's, but that's only the starting point. Earlier in his comments, Mr. Pink made the comment, believers are required to use the means of grace, which God has appointed, and look to him to bless the same. Now, I would like to discuss what some of those means of grace are that God has appointed for us to use, okay? One of them is God's Word. That is a means of grace that He has given to us. Listen to Acts twenty thirty two. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Do you see that, beloved? God has given us one of the greatest means of grace that he's given us is his word. But here's another one that a lot of people seem to overlook. And that is God, one of the greatest means of grace that God has given us is his church. God expects us to be part of a local church. Why? Well, listen to Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Did you hear that? For the perfecting of the saints or the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ until we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or a completely mature man unto the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So do you see God get one of the means of grace that God given, gave us is the local church with its pastors and teachers and the fellowship of believers. This is a means of grace that God has given to us to help us grow. Okay? Well, what's another one? Well, how about prayer? Prayer is another means of grace. In uh, Hebrews four sixteen, listen to what it says. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, because of what Jesus did, because he was the rock that was struck, we may now come into his presence and speak and request to obtain mercy and grace 
to find help in time of need. Prayer is a means of grace. The door has been opened by the blood of Jesus. The veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place where God's presence was has been torn down. And now we, as priests of God, can enter in to the holy of holies where our high priest sits, making intercession for us. So God's word, church, and prayer are all means of grace that God has given to us. But how about this one? The Holy Spirit is a means of grace. Jesus said, When He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and will show you things to come. He shall glorify Me, for He shall receive of Mine, and show it unto you. So the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a means of grace. Well, are there any more? Well, sure there are. How about spiritual gifts? Spiritual gifts are given to us as a means of grace. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit With all, meaning the whole body of Christ. Your gifts have been given to you to minister grace to others. Did you realize that? Uh, We are ministers of grace one to another through the gifts that God has given to us. Beloved, there's one more I want to bring up that's a means of grace. And very few of us ever recognize this. But it truly is a means of grace that God has given us. And that is the trials and the tribulations that he allows to come into our life. We don't often look at those as a means of grace. But beloved, they are. They are. We read in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 5 through 7. Listen. We are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be be revealed in the last time. And in this salvation you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be. Listen, sometimes we need trials and tribulations. Though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness, and that could be translated to depression. You're in heaviness through manifold temptations or trials, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now we talked about last week a man named Polycarp. He was a disciple of John, the Apostle John, and he lived up into the hundreds, and he was a great man of God, and he was burnt at the stake because he refused to deny Christ. And so he had a trial where he was tried but with fire. But it, he was found into praise and honor and glory. And what I want you to understand is this. Trials sometimes are a means of grace. Notice it says, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. Why do we need Trials, Lord, why do we need temptations? Because more often than not, it brings us to see our need of Him more than ever. And it causes us to draw closer to Him than we ever draw because we're undergoing the trials and the tribulations. And when we draw close to Him, beloved, that is the greatest thing that could happen in our life, being close to him. I'll close with this. I had a missionary friend one time who was a missionary to Honduras, him and his family. And he came and spoke uh, at a local assembly where we was at. And he said this. He said, I never knew that God was all I needed until God was all I had. And there... <laughs> There's a great truth in that. He learned and he grew in his faith and in grace because God allowed him to come down to where he had absolutely nothing. 
And then God showed himself faithful. Beloved, there's some amazing truths in this. So remember these truths, I pray. And I pray that you bless this week and that you'll serve the Lord till you're out of breath. Amen. Amen.